our offensive frustrations, ranging from guys not thinking they're getting enough touches to guys just struggling, have taken a toll on our defense. It shouldn't. And it's not a legitimate excuse, but I'm just giving you the facts. That's exactly what's happened. Our offensive frustration is affecting us on the defensive end. We're losing hard a little bit, and that's concerning. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Fantrax and Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and as always you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We're going to cover all of the seven games for Saturday. We're going to cover all of the seven games for Sunday in today's podcast. So let's get to it. To it. Hopefully I'm not rambling on for an hour and 40 minutes or two hours like the last two shows. I'm going to keep this one concise maybe, but you know what? This is the way that, that I roll. Shit will come into my head and then, and then I'll go off on a tangent and then we'll start talking. But let's kick it off right away with the monstrous line of the night. Really hard to have too much of a debate about this one, although I guess you could uh, consider his former teammate in consideration, and that is Russell Westbrook with the monstrous line of the night. He had another triple-double, but it was a huge one. 26 points, 11 rebounds, 22 assists. That is it's ridiculous. One three-pointer, yeah, whatever. Two steals, one block. 9 of 17 from the field and 7 of 7 from the line. I've highlighted some of Westbrook's struggles of late. And over the last two weeks, he's not a top 10 player. He's just inside the top 15, and that's even with today's performance. But getting those sort of numbers is obviously ridiculous. And if you drafted Westbrook, I hope you were punting field goal percentage because it was something that you had to do heading into the season. And if you're not, then... Or if you weren't and you tried to recover from it, you're obviously feeling that pain right at the moment. He is shooting... Only 42% from the field, but when he was 45 last year on 18 attempts and 42 on 24 attempts, it's a big difference. We look at Zed's score difference last year. He was a negative 0.33. This year, negative 2.01. So we're talking almost seven times the negative impact that he is having on field goal percentage this season as opposed to what he did last season. So it was always in line for a, for a big dip. I think he can get better at, you know, when Victor Oladipo comes back, maybe that helps him somewhat, but that he was always in for a pretty significant dip, and look, he love what he's doing counting stats-wise, still averaging a triple-double, one and a half steals, almost two triples as well. I don't need to talk too much about Russ Westbrook. It was just a huge night to get a, uh, to get 22 assists is massive, especially in a head-to-head weekly type of situation or your weekly matchup when you are on the second last day and, and one bloke chucks in 22 assists. That's... That's like the output of four other guys, five other guys maybe. It's such a big, big deal. It's such a huge amount to put out there. Let's talk waiver wire line of the night. And it is. It is Uncle P, Nick Young. 32 points for uh, for Uncle. Eight triples. In, con- in standard Nick Young style, I guess, two rebounds, three assists, one steal. But he did it fantastically with his shooting, 12 of 19 from the field. And... I think if we had a vote now, this is with me just going off the top of my head, if I went to look through all the teams, who has been the biggest surprise this year? I think Nick Young is it, because honestly, at the start of the year, we didn't think that he'd be on the Lakers roster. We thought they're either going to trade him, and if they can't trade him, they're just going to waive him. But no, no, they're not doing that. They're not waving him. Let's let's start him. Let's have him be a key part of what we're doing, and then have him respond in a positive fashion. He is, unbelievably, a top 100 player this season. He's ranked 98th on the year in only 25 minutes a game. And where's that coming from, do you ask? Well, it's coming from the fact that he's hitting 2.7 triples a game, which is obviously massive. He's not doing a lot else. He's hitting 91% of his free throws on less than two attempts a game, which is still okay. It's not a massive, uh, not a, not a massive influencer in that category, but still a 0.5 Z score in that category is fine. And I think the big difference here is Nick Young shot 34% from the field last year. He shot 37 from the field the year before. He's at 47 this season. That is such a significant jump. You're not often guys will, will jump by 13% in the field goal category to go from a guy that that brutalizes you in that category to now being a bloke who is right on average and doesn't hurt or doesn't help. And then when you are you are average in that category, and this is the strength of a guy like Kyle Corver in years past or JJ Redick, 
We'll hit your two and a half, three triples a game, and we won't affect your field goal percentage. That's where Nick Young is at the moment. So you would have to classify him as that guy, as JJ Redick, basically. That's sort of where he is this year. And it sounds so dumb to say out loud, and I'm saying it out loud and going, Josh, you sound like a dickhead. You're comparing Nick Young and JJ Redick. But that's sort of where they're at. You get one assist a game. It means nothing. You get two and a half rebounds. Putrid. Less than half a steal. Less than half a block. Doesn't get to the line. Shoots it well. Doesn't get there, though. But almost three triples, 14 points, 47% from the field. That's Redick. Is Nick Young a must-own guy? I don't know if he's a must-own guy. Can he keep up this shooting percentage? I don't know if he can keep this level up, but I think that he's going to be... Uh, there's no doubt he's going to be better than what we've seen the last couple of years. It should be relatively obvious thinking about Nick Young, thinking that his play is influenced by his state of mind. There's just certain guys that you can see that being being the case for, and he is one of those players, and his state of mind is positive. Him and, and D'Angelo Russell have patched up their differences. They're playing well together. They play fantastically together, to be honest, and he's in a, a great frame of mind, and it's really helping what he's doing shooting-wise. I would expect something of a drop-off, maybe down to 44 or 45. But if you need threes without the hurt in percentages, Nick Young's one of the guys who's around, and you can grab him. Not not 100% a must-own guy, because again, you can find threes generally. You can add a, a, you know, a guy like Mirza Toledovic or Boyan Bogdanovic, these sort of blokes who can come in and hit you two or three threes, and, and that's where they're adding. Like He's not helping you in the rare categories. But doing it at such efficiency with a true shooting at 62%, which is just, it's ridiculously high. It is so high, this true shooting percentage, that you can't help but fear that there is some drop-off coming. But him doing it at this efficiency means he has to be looked at. 10 teams? No, I would guess not. 12s? you got to look, and you got to see how it fits your team. But he has been an absolute surprise and a lot of the stuff that he's doing is not necessarily even fantasy related what he's doing defensively is helping the lakers to a to a huge degree and i'm sure the blokes over on locked on lakers anthony Irwin and harrison fagan would agree with me so i suggest you check out locked on lakers if you're a lakers fan it's obviously a must listen harrison and anthony do a great job they were awesome when they came onto my podcast uh in september we had a we had a great time i believe we even spent the last 15 minutes talking about seinfeld they're, they're great guys. They're humorous. They get some good uh, good interviews. I Now, maybe I'm misremembering. I think they had James Worthy on a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Harrison's big into the, the D-League with the Lakers as well, so you get lots of Ivica Zubac updates and lots of talk with the D-League guys. Anthony and Harrison do a fantastic job. If you're a Lakers fan, you have to be listening to this. But if you're a fan of any every other any other team, the Locked On Podcast Network has you covered. We've got a podcast for every team. And that's our motto, your team every day. Check it out, whatever it is. Raptors, Knicks, Nets. Celtics, Mavericks. We've got a podcast for all of them. I'm highlighting Anthony and Harrison today. They do a great job, and they're going to have all your Uncle P updates moving forward. Let's talk young gun of the night, and this bloke's got a, got a few of them this season. We uh, we shouldn't be surprised, really, because Carl Anthony Towns is very good. He had 41 today. That's huge. 15 boards, 5 assists, a triple, a block, 10 of 12 from the line, 15 of 28 from the field. This is the sort of thing that is not going to be that rare for Towns, I don't think. When we talked about him, and I talked about him a lot last year, we said that you know, he's a guy that at some point in his career could average four assists a game. No doubt about that. He could average you know, two blocks, four assists, one and a half triples maybe. Yeah, you know, Obviously 20 and 10, no problem. Well, he's got the 20 and 10 covered. He's at 22 and 11. He's hitting 1.3 triples, so he's almost at one and a half threes. He's giving you one and a half blocks. That can go up. And he's at 2.3 assists, and that can grow. But again, he had the five here. That can get up, and he's got so much more room to grow. He's seen a massive dip of 7% in his field goal percentage. That has to turn around. His free throws have dropped as well. We've seen that drop from 81 down to 78. So he's got room to improve. He's ranked 21 on the year, which for you people who took him at number three, you're probably disappointed at. I never would have taken him at three. I was more than happy to take him between the six to 10 range. And I think that he can get back there. He's probably more likely to fit in that 12 zone, 15 to 12 zone when all is said and done. Um, but there is, it's going to come down to what happens with his percentages. Do they stay at average level or do they become a real positive? If he gets back to 52%, then that becomes a real positive for him. In addition to being a 20 and 11 or 22 and 11 with one and a half blocks and maybe three, three and a half assists, he can do all of that. So I think we're going to have a pretty steady, solid second half of the year. 
for Towns. And we just got to hope that this shooting turns around because that's going to influence what he does in the rankings wise. But otherwise, hey, look, you picked him early and don't get caught up on ranks. I say this all the time, that don't get caught up on a rank. I picked him at three and he's at 21. Yeah, bust. Look at the, You're still getting 22 and 11 with one and a half blocks and 1.3 triples. Like he's still getting good numbers. It's not the end of the world that he's ranked 21st because rankings in the end mean nothing. It's all about how it affects your team and the way that your team is built. So I think he can get better. And I use rankings just as a reference, but don't, don't take them to heart. I think it's probably the best way for me to put it. Yesterday's podcast, I did mention the uh, dud of the night. I said, I think if you listen to the DFS portion, I said, when you play the Warriors and you're a center, you're in for a pretty shit night. And Mason Plumley is the dud of the night. He played the Warriors, he's a center, and he was bad. Four points, two rebounds, five assists, and a steal. One of six from the field, two of five from the free throw line. And it's weird to say this, but it's not because the Warriors have centers that just kill other teams' centers. It's because they just don't play centers at times. And they rotate things through. And opposition centers, because they're getting their ass kicked, they just take them off. He only played 18 minutes today, in large part because of the way that the Warriors when the Warriors were absolutely destroying them. But this is just common practice. Who, that centers that play the Warriors, it's never a good DFS bet. And Mason Plumley fell straight into that category today. He's been really impressive, though, over the last two weeks. He's a top 100 guy, 11, 6.5, 3.5. One and a half steals, one and a half blocks on 50% shooting. The 53 from the line is a definite concern, and he is basically a punt free throw guy at this point. He's shooting 51% from the line on 3.3 attempts, which, while not 100% non recoverable from, when you've got a Z score of negative two and a half, which is where he currently sits, it makes it pretty tough. And over the last two weeks, he's approaching five attempts a game, and that makes it even tougher with a Z score of negative three. That makes it really hard to recover from. So I don't think he's available on a waiver wire, but if you're doing a trade with Plumley, just be aware your free throw percentage is going to take a significant dip. It will. You have to be a really strong team. You've got to be a team that's sort of placed on an average at like 83, 84% to take him on and still become strong in that or decently strong because he will impact it. Even though it's one bloke, it's the, the attempt level and does bring things down pretty quickly. So just be aware of that. But otherwise, everything he's doing has been really impressive. The defensive numbers are fantastic. The assist numbers out of position are really good. This is just a case of you're a center, you play the Warriors. It's just how things go this year, unfortunately. All right, let's let's uh, let's forget about Mason Plumley now. Let's move into these games and talk about them in a little bit of extra detail. The first one we're going to talk about is the Phoenix Suns and the Oklahoma City Thunder. This was the first game of the night, and Devin Booker was fantastic for Phoenix. 33 minutes for Booker, 31 points, three triples, three rebounds, five assists, and a steal. And the best part is he hit 50% of his shots, 11 of 22 from the field and six of seven from the line and three of six from three. So this is exactly what we want. And if he can do this more often, then obviously his value rises. A lot of what's been plaguing him this year has just been the shots haven't been going in. But he found it, he found it, really good going here. The assists were nice. A really good night for, for Devin Booker. Tyson Chandler had 10 and 9 in 27 minutes, but Alex Len back limits his upside. Now, Len was great, but played limited minutes. Had foul trouble, so I do grant Earl Watson that. Four fouls in 14 minutes. Eight and seven with a steal and a block was really useful, but Chandler, Len, and Marquise Chris are going to all sort of be limited now by the presence of all three of these guys. Now, Chris had been almost 30 minutes the last two games. He played just 24 here. Eight and eight with a three and a block on three of 11 shooting. Now, the return of Len does limit what he can do upside-wise, but this is three you know, relatively strong or impressive long-term outlook type games from Marquise Chris. I'm still not 100% convinced that he is ever going to be a good player because he just looks lost so often defensively um, and he just feels like his IQ is a, a step or two too slow on, on the court. But the stats are starting to come. He's in that Brandon Ingram category to me that if you're in a weekly changes league or a roto league, you might want to stash him just to see what happens over these coming weeks. In a 14-team league, I would grab him. Just the minutes are moving in the right direction. The production is as well. In a 12, look, I guess it depends on who you're dropping. If you're dropping someone completely expendable, Yusuf Nurkic, you can grab Chris and, and see how it works. 
see how he sits and, and see what happens over the next two games. But I think we're going to see him, instead of being 16 minutes a game, instead of being 30 minutes a game, he might move to 23 or 24. And that's probably not going to be enough for him to register too highly on the standard league radar. But if he had a shot better today, look, as he was only 3 of 11, if he had gone 6 of 11, we could have been talking about a 15 and 8 game with a 3 and a block. And I would have said, brilliant. So there is potential there. So if, you, if you're a, a guy that wants to get ahead of the pack and you've got that spot, which is why you always want to have one of these spots, let's take a flyer on it, see what happens over the next week. And then Chris is the guy to have a look at. TJ Warren made his long-awaited return, just the 14 minutes for Warren, two points, two rebounds, one block. He is owned in only 68% of Yahoo League. So if he's in yours, go and grab him. This is, uh, look, he's just going to ease himself back. Maybe it takes a week. Who knows? But he will get back into uh, into action, and his return probably just just knocks the top a bit off Eric Bledsoe's numbers. Now Bledsoe wasn't great in here, and he is dealing with a with a minor groin problem at the moment. Thirty one minutes for Bledsoe, 12, 3, and four. Not a horrible night. His shot didn't fall, but T.J. Warren, when he was playing early in the season, his usage was out of control because he's so efficient with the ball and that could go back to happening so we might see just a little bit of value come off Bledsoe because Bledsoe's explosion came when Warren went out PJ Tucker played 33 minutes the PJ Tucker time in terms of the big minutes is going to drop he's still going to play because his defense has been really good but I don't think he's going to keep that job from TJ Warren 5-2-2 and two for Tucker with two steals he's not a standard league type of player not much else to talk about with the Suns in this one. Brandon Knight, just the 20 minutes with eight points. He loses out with Warren back as well. I don't think he's any reason you should be holding. If Brandon Knight's owned in 75% of leagues and Warren's owned in 68. That should not be the case. Knight is not a 12-teamer. Warren absolutely is. So have a look and see if you can uh, if you can make a switch or if you've got Knight, get rid of him. On to the Thunder. Steve Adams, 19-7-2 with two steals. A nice night from uh, Adams. And they made a change to the starting lineup. No Vic Oladipo still. But they didn't go with uh, Jeremy Granting, which is fair enough because he's been terrible. Anthony Morrow started 21 minutes for Morrow. He hit 11 points. Well, he didn't hit 11 points. He scored 11 points. He hit three triples, and he had two steals. This is as Morrow a line as it gets. No rebounds, no assists. We talk about three-point specialists. There's so many of them around. Yeah, Nick Young's around. Marco Ballinelli's around. You know, Kyle Korver is potentially around. If you're looking for guys to stream for threes, you're going to have those guys way ahead of Anthony Morrow in your standard leagues. He's, he's more a deeper league guy, but it, when he goes back to the bench, he'll still probably play the same amount of minutes, hit a couple of threes, but he just does nothing else. Andre Robertson had three steals in 35 minutes, had 11 points. You know what he is as well. He's a he's somewhat of a specialist. He can be owned in 12-team leagues, but it's far from a, a must-own situation. And Jeremy Grant had himself a triple one in 29 bench minutes. Sabonis, 9-4 and four in 24 minutes, continues to start and continues to not really be all that impressive. A nice triple one from him, though, and I think he's going to be a good player in the future, but we're talking 16-20 to 20 team leagues, really, at this point. Enes Kanter only played 14 minutes. Still produces, though, 12 and 5 with a block, and that's still good. The minutes are a real concern, and they're up and down all the time. So Cantor, I, I still think that in most 12s, you do want to own him, but not not a concrete ownership sort of a player, if that makes sense. I hope it does. It's a, it's a phrase that I just invented. Indiana and Detroit. The Pacers on the road get the victory. Paulie George, 26-7-2, and two, two steals and a block. A really good night from George, especially considering he hit 52% of his 21 shots. Well, Jeff Teague just missed the triple-double. 19-9-8 for Teague with two steals. And Thad Young had 12 points on just eight shots. So still not getting the touches, but when he converts them, it's useful. Not a 10-teamer, but more a 12-team league guy. Glenn Robinson the third had been starting the last couple of games with Monte Ellis out, and he's done nothing. But in this one, he actually did something. A double-double with 12 points and 12 boards in 36 minutes. But with Ellis and Rodney Stuckey likely back for the next game, there's no, no real need to deal with Robinson outside of deep dynasties or 30-team leagues, I'd say. CJ Miles had 10 points with two triples. He's uh, a deeper league guy and hasn't been able to take advantage of the fact that both Ellis and Stuckey have been out. While Miles Turner... This pisses me off when Miles Turner takes just seven shots. I'm going to give you the list of players on the Pacers who took the same or more shots as Miles Turner. Paul George, Jeff Teague, Thad Young, Glenn Robinson, CJ Miles, Al Jefferson, and Aaron Brooks. That situation should never arise. 28 minutes for Turner. 
it is not enough minutes for him either. Yes, I know they got the victory in the end. It was pretty comfortable, but he shouldn't be as marginalized as that. Now, Jefferson took 10 shots, hit three of them, had eight and nine in 17 minutes. He is, he's really just a disaster on the court, and there's no way that he should be taking more shots than Miles Turner in, t- in 12 less minutes. But I guess that's what he does. He's paid to take shots. I don't know if he's paid to miss them like he did, but that's a, that is what he is paid to do. For the Pearsons, nice game for Reggie Jackson, and I know Reggie Jackson owners will be rubbing their hands saying, yes, great, 19-3-10 for Reggie in 29 minutes, but the the ones of you who own Reggie Jackson who look at it and go, man, can't wait till he's off his minutes restriction and he gets 35 minutes, then it's going to be huge. You don't get so happy, and I've said this before plenty of times, but I have new listeners coming in all the time. This is what he's going to do. He's going to play 29 to 30 minutes. This is it for him. This is the minutes restriction gone. He can be really productive in this time, but his upside is capped by whatever whatever bullshit theory Stan Van Gundy has on point guards. Two straight big games for Cantavius Corwell Pope, 20 and 5 with five triples. Not a great shooting night, 6 of 18, but this is almost the uh, carbon copy of what he was doing most of last season. Chucking up a lot of shots, hitting them, some of them, playing minutes and putting up decent numbers. Toby Harris had a, a decent game, 30 and 7. There was no Johnny Lua. And this one, he'd been playing really solidly before this. He was out with back spasms. You would have thought that someone would have been able to take advantage of that. Unfortunately, they weren't. Marcus Morris was dreadful. Nine points with one rebound for Morris. You know my take on him. He's a borderline 12-team league guy. While Andre Drummond was also fairly useless. Nine points on 11 shots. But 15 boards is good. Two steals is good. One block is good. But he should never be going 4 of 11 when you're an athletic 7-foot center That like Drummond is. Uh, Stan Johnson got some extra run with Johnny Lua out. He played just the 20... Well, he played 20 minutes, which is good for Stan Johnson. Only 3 points. Not a lot else happening there, but still comfortably in the rotation ahead of Darren Healy. We also got a Henry Allenson siding in Lua's absence. 5 minutes for Allenson. Hit both his shots. Both were threes. I don't think Van Gundy could have asked for anything more. And that is exactly why Allenson was drafted, to be the stretch four, to be Ryan Anderson, to be John Lua, to be that that power forward who hits threes. And we've barely seen him this season, and this is uh, some really nice things. that I think Pistons fans will look at it and go, yeah, that's that's cool. That's cool. Let's see how let's see where this goes from here. But definitely a, a really nice uh, nice p- performance from, uh, from Henry Allenson. Charlotte and Atlanta, big win for the for the um, Hornets on the road. Kemba Walker was back, only the 18 points for Kemba, but in a surprise to Kemba Walker owners, he had 10 assists. That doesn't happen very often, so just uh, use that as a bonus. That's almost a, a two-game output for Kemba usually. Four triples, six rebounds, good to have him back, while Ramon Sessions went back to a 14-minute uh, role as expected. Marv Williams is uh, somewhat heating up. Seven of 10 shooting for Marvin, 19 points. Four triples, six rebounds, two assists, and a steal. Still no block, but he was never going to continue to shoot at like 34%, which he was shooting. He's also not going to be a 70% shooter, quite obviously, but he was always going to progress further. I just think his upside is really limited by who he is as a player. And if the blocks aren't going to come, and they haven't come at all this year, then his ability to be that top 70 type of guy that he was last year is severely impacted. Yeah, of course you can own him, but... Does one game erase the previous 20 where he's been terrible? I don't think it fully erases, but this is two or three in a row where Marv has been a little bit more impressive, which is good. Michael Kidd-Gilchrist is just not playing the minutes, and this is not going to change. Steve Clifford has a, has a strategy, defense first, offense last, and they close with Balinelli. Kidd-Gilchrist played 20 minutes, went 4-2 and two with a block. He doesn't produce in a high enough rate to be useful in 20 minutes. Get rid of him. Marco Balinelli. Yeah, just add, whatever I said with Nick Young, add it to Ballinelli. 30 minutes for Ballinelli, 19 points, three triples, three rebounds, and one assist on eight of 11 shooting. He's hitting a lot of threes. He looks a lot more engaged than last season, but he doesn't do a huge amount else apart from score and hit threes, and that's uh, what he did now. Who's ready for a Cody Zeller uh, chat? 36 minutes for Zeller, 16 points, 11 rebounds, owned in under 50% of leagues. This needs to change immediately. I don't understand why he's not owned in... 60, 60. Why is Brendan Knight owned in 75% of leagues and Cody Zeller in 43? Cody Zeller is very, very good. And it doesn't always show up in fantasy. It definitely doesn't always uh, show up in DFS numbers. But he has to be owned in 12-team leagues. It's it's pretty much as simple as that. Nick Batum, not a great night. 7-3-4, but the four steals is pretty tasty. 3-13 of 13 from the field. 
for Batum uh, hurts. Well, Frankie Kaminsky had nine points in his 18 minutes. His run as a 12-team you know, tease guy is uh, is clearly over. On to the Hawks. Paulie Millsap, 20 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists. That's a nice Paul Millsap night. While Dwight Howard grabbed 23 rebounds. 10 points only for Dwight, but a really good night there as well. They started Tim Hardaway Jr. again. And he ran the point a lot, which is just weird to see. 21 points for Hardaway on 17 shots. He's not afraid to throw it up there. Four rebounds, four assists, four triples, and one block. A really good night, and he's been solid the last couple of games. I don't think that you're rushing to get him in 12-team leagues because how long is this role sticking uh, as it is? We don't know. Kent Bazemore off the bench had a good game. I know that's something I haven't said very often. 30 minutes for Bazemore. 17 points, four rebounds, five assists, a three, and a block, and seven of 13 shooting for Kent. What do we make uh, of this for Kent? We know that he can be better than he's been. He did show it for a couple of months last season. I don't think that he is overall much better than we've seen. I think this is somewhat of of a fluky shooting night for Bazemore. Do they reintroduce him to the starting lineup, or do they keep, keep Hardaway there, who has been impressive in that time? They used three wings for majority of the time, Bazemore, Hardaway, and Cephalosha, all three of those getting over 30 minutes, while Kyle Korver was reduced to under 20 minutes. It'll be interesting to see exactly how they uh, how they run that moving forward. But I think that Cephalosha is a 12-team league guy for his ability to contribute rebound steals blocks. Hardaway, look, if Hardaway sticks as a 30-minute guy, you could see him in that Marco Bellinelli, Nick Young sort of position. And Bazemore with his steal numbers is what would kept him in the conversation. None of them are absolute 100% lock, must own, top 100 type of guys. They're all, if you own Tarbo or Bazemore, they're all guys who are going to be your 11th or 12th best guy most likely. So this doesn't change a huge amount for me on Bazemore's outlook, but it's obviously encouraging. Dennis Schroeder, not not a great night from Schroeder. Missed both his free throws, which hurts. 12, 4, and 6. No threes, no steals. So it looks that's a very Derek Rose line, actually. Um, but he'd been flying, so I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be too bothered by uh, one subpar performance, although it was a really tasty matchup for him, and he couldn't take advantage. The Lakers and the Cavs talked about Uncle P already. D'Angelo Russell sat this one out, so the Lakers started Brandon Ingram. They went with the let's start no point guard lineup, and... They were competitive. They were good. And Brandon Ingram almost had a triple-double. And this is why... And it doesn't happen as much anymore. Triple-doubles used to be such an overrated stat in fantasy. And I used to get plenty of pushback. Oh, man, he had a triple-double. Oh, he he got these triple-doubles. He had led the league in triple-doubles. Lance Stevenson, shout-out. The difference between a a Russell Westbrook 26, 11, and 22 triple-double and a Brandon Ingram almost triple-double of 9, 10, and 9 is massive. It's such a big difference. So Ingram almost got the triple-double. You know, one more point, one more assist, and we would have been hailing him for getting a triple-double. How much different is it? It's not different. And that's, that was always my point. But that's impressive for Ingram. I still think that when Russell comes back, what we saw is him getting these 25-minute rolls and being limited in what he was doing. And that makes him really really difficult to deal with in non-stashable 12-team formats. And I don't think much has changed there. Seven assists for Julius Randle as well, 16, 4, and 7. While another strong Luol Deng game, 15, 8, and 3 a steal, and three triples. I think you've got to look at Deng in 14-teamers, and I think you actually do have to look at him in 12-teamers. As stupid as it sounds, you you have to consider it. I won't be adding him, most likely, but he's he was a guy that in 20-team leagues, you'd say, nah, man, you can have him. But at this point, the form is, is turned around completely. The minutes are back up, and he's playing really well, Luol Deng. So with the way that things are currently going, you absolutely have to consider it, and you have to see how can this guy help my team? How does his points, how do his threes, how do his nice rebounds from the small forward position, how do they help my team? And they could. Also good to see Jordan Clarkson get a big game, 20-5 and five with four triples on th- in 31 minutes. He had been struggling for a pretty long time. I still think that you want him in 12-team leagues, but he was getting perilously close to being not that guy. Lou Williams. Yeah, the, uh, the drop is happening. 12, 3, and 4 in 27 minutes for Lou. 2 of 10 shooting. And this is this is always when you see crazy, crazy hot streaks for guys that just don't do it or don't do it consistently. It's going to happen. And we're seeing it happen now with Lou. Hopefully, you were able to trade him when he was that constant top 40 guy for about two weeks. 
You may have been able to because there are there are people around who, when this was happening, no, nah, Lou's going to be a top 40 guy rest of the season. There were, there were people who were saying that. I didn't agree with that, but that's why I say you trade, you know, seek out a trade because it probably won't happen in your league. You might have five leagues and only Williams in all five of them, and it might not happen in one of them. But there are people out there who are into fantasy basketball enough that they follow me, that they listen to this, that will say things like that. So that's why you, you look at it and say, okay, well, if he thinks that he's going to be a top 40 guy the rest of the season, I'll take your top 40 bloke back, and let's see how this pans out later on. It, it, he is dropping off a bit. And again, when Russell comes back, he probably won't get 27. When Russell plays the next game, Lou will go down to 24 minutes. And he'll still be productive, and you still want to hold him. No doubt about any of that stuff. But yeah, somewhat of a drop-off happening here for Louis Williams. Only 15 minutes for Tim Mozgov in this one. For the Cavs, it was Kyrie, Kevin Love, and LeBron doing it all. 21, 6, and 12 for Kyrie with three steals. Love went 27, 17, and 4. And LeBron went 26, 7, and 9 with a Richie Benno. This is a huge night from LeBron. Soured it with going 6 from 11 from the free throw line. And he's been quite a negative from the line this season. But uh, the other numbers have been fairly impressive for LeBron. Tristan Thompson, I thought he'd be in the spot for a pretty good game. Didn't quite pan out that way. 6 and 6 in the 27 minutes. Well, J.R. Smith had a good game. And that's something we don't say that often. 14 points with 4 triples on 5 of 8 shooting. But... One steal, zero assists, zero blocks, one rebound. Again, the shot doesn't go in, and we're talking about an absolutely horrible type of game from JR. He is not a 12-team must-own player. The next game we'll look at is the Houston Rockets and the Minnesota Timberwolves. Big, big Ryan Anderson night, 28 and 6 with seven triples, with three steals and a block. You bottle those four defensive stats from Anderson, and you lock them away, and you'll never, ever, ever, ever get them again. This is just not what he does, and this is a really, really impressive night. I've been completely disappointed with Anderson this season, but when you put up a good game, then you get some credit. Jimmy Harden just missed the triple-double, 28, 9, and 13, but added three triples and two blocks, while Eric Gordon, man, this guy keeps going. 20 points, six rebounds, four assists, four triples, two steals, good shooting, on fire. Pat Bev wasn't quite there, but as a rebounding point guard, it doesn't get much better. Ten boards for him, only six points. But four assists and two steals, you have to love Pat Beverly. Clint Capella suffered a uh, leg contusion. He played just 15 minutes, but he was flying. He hadn't missed a shot. He had 10 points, four rebounds. Uh, let's hope it doesn't cause him to miss time. Obviously, if he does miss time, your deeper leagues will grab Montrez Harrell. Nene will come into play for maybe 14 teamers. But I think we're going to see a bit more Decker, Nene, and Harrell, and not enough to make any of them absolute 12-team must-own guys. They didn't do a huge amount in this one. Anyway, even with um, even with Capella out, they played a bit more Ryan Anderson at center and went with Harden, Beverly, Gordon, Ariza, Anderson as their as their core five in this game. And that's probably the way that they'd lean with that moving forward if uh, if Capella happens to uh, miss time. Didn't see any um, any pussy tweets, any bitch tweets, any soft tweets coming for Clint Capella because he had to leave the game because his leg got bruised. What's the difference? His name's on Anthony Davis. Seriously, this it, it, this shit just happens. Minnesota Timberwolves. Every starter bar Gorgie Jeng played 40-plus minutes. It was an overtime game, so I do give Tom Thibodeau somewhat of a pass. Rick Rubio, this is a very, very Rubio line. Seven points on seven shots, but one three, eight rebounds, seven assists, four steals. It is... He's going to continue to play minutes. He's looking a little bit more comfortable. The defense is starting to look a little bit better. His role in the offense is, is marginally improving, and it's getting back there. Now, he is available on some waiver wires. I would be grabbing him if he's around there because he is starting to you know, fit just a little bit better, and that is a quintessential Rubio type of line. Zach Levine played 45 minutes. This guy is getting ground into dust. 24, 2, and 6 with a steal and three triples. But he has been fantastic this year. Well, Wigo, not the greatest night. 5 of 17 from the field for Wigo. 13, 6, and 5 is nice, especially the six rebounds and the five assists and the three steals. 
and a block. So when the shot wasn't falling, it's good that he can actually add these other things because that's not something we've really ever seen from Andrew Wiggins. It wasn't a great Gorgie Jeng night, four and seven with two blocks in this game. Still gave you the defensive numbers, but overall not a big night. And the bench, not much happening with the bench. Chris Dunn was poor. Uh, Nimanya Bielitsa had 10 points in 15 minutes. And uh, Cole Aldrich somehow played 14 minutes without taking a single shot. Not a lot to really talk about on that bench. Good to see they played Tyus Jones 11 seconds. Not sure why Jones was uh, or has been really impressive so far this season in the time that he's played. Let's look at the Knicks and the Nuggets. Man, the Nuggets games, they're just, they're just ridiculous these days. The scores are so high. Mallow returned for the Knicks. 29 points, 4 rebounds, 3 assists, and 2 triples. This is a very nice Mallow game against his former team in his former home stadium. And there was no Derek Rose, so we got a big Brandon Jennings game. 14 points with 7 assists and 3 steals. You know my take on him. Field goals are an issue, but regardless of if Rose is in or not, his assists and steal numbers are still useful for 12-team leagues. Chris Stapps, Porzingis. Porzingis. Thank you. 22 and 7 in 38 minutes. Two steals, so a real rebound after that Draymond Green shutdown. The shots weren't there, but he still took 19 of them, which led the team quite considerably. So a, a nice game from Chris Stapps, while Courtney Lee went back to being... Courtney Lee, 10 points in 36 minutes, and his upside is just so limited. Speaking of limited upside, Joakim Noah played 11 minutes, 2-4. and four. There, He's only in 42% of the league. that leagues. That feels high. But unfortunately, this did not this did not result in Jeff Hornacek getting his cock out. Kylo Quinn played just 7 minutes and registered one block because it was Billy Hernan Gomez's time. Now, Hernan Gomez played 28 minutes had 17 and 10 with two blocks, and that's two games in a row where Hernan Gomez has played more minutes than O'Quinn, and this is hearkening back to what we saw you know, early, mid-November, where it was one game O'Quinn, one game Hernan Gomez, and they just shuffled those guys. We thought that O'Quinn had you know, taken that with some huge performances and was constantly outplaying Joakim Noah, which really is not much of an accomplishment at this point, but they've gone back to Hernan Gomez, and that makes it really tough to own O'Quinn at this point. He's uh, he's up and down at Hornet Sex. Use of him is up and down. Now, Hernan Gomez, I'll say this again, Hernan Gomez is an Escanter-ish. He is points and rebounds. You get a couple of blocks from him here, but what he is, his points, his rebounds, his field goals, his free throw percentage. He's, he's Ennis Cantor. You get the occasional block, you know, no no assists. He's not as stretchy as what Cantor can be, but that's sort of what he game his game is. Good scorer, good rebounder, high efficiency finisher. And that can obviously be useful, but he needs to maintain a solid role. It's going to be interesting to see how they run this. I don't think we want to look at Hernan Gomez in any 12-team leagues or probably even 14-team leagues at this point, but is it crazy for me to say that both Billy and Cock are both better than Joachim Noah at this point? And obviously, Porzingis as a center word, which is his best position, are all better than uh, Joachim Noah? That's looking like an awesome contract. Justin Holiday, only the 20 minutes, and that massive performance he had the other night was was clearly fueled by the six steals. He played the 20 minutes, had 10 points. We didn't get as much Ronnie Baker in this one, 12 minutes for four and five for the Nuggets, it was Emmanuel Moutier's time to have a big one. 22-7-5 with two threes and a steal on 10 of 15 shooting. So if you see a big Moutier line, have a look. How did he shoot? Did he shoot it out of his ass or did he shoot it at his regular piss-poor level? Well, this one, out of his ass. So then it makes you think, okay, if the shot is normal Emmanuel Moutier, does he play those minutes and does those, do those numbers come? The answer is probably not. You, you should still be looking at him and saying, I know what he can do. He's a punt field goal guy, and he should be owned in that situation. But I would say if the shot wouldn't fall here, then he wouldn't have played this many minutes. Gaz Harris played 30, 16, 3, and 2 with a 3, owned in under 50% of leagues. Go to all your leagues and grab him, please. Well, Farton Will Barton turned in a really huge performance, actually. 17, 8, and 2 for Barton. Two triples, two steals, one block on 6 of 10 shooting. I still don't think he's going to be an absolute must-own guy for the rest of the season, but this was an impressive performance, as was Kenneth Farid, who had 25 and 7 in 29 minutes, three blocks on 9 of 11 shooting. You don't like the 5 of 10 from the line, but with this new rotation that is this high-powered Nuggets offense all of a sudden, yeah, Farid is, is clearly in it, and he's in this bench role, and he has got extra minutes the last couple of games because Jokic has been limited by foul trouble in a significant way, but I I will tell you easily that I don't think Farid is as highly rated as what some people... I don't think he's as good as as the ratings that people give him or as, as much as people love him, um, which definitely happens, but in this role, just grab him. See how it goes. 
and just see see what he can do because this is two big games in this bench role in a row. And to be honest, Jokic and Farid have a have a fairly good chemistry. We've seen it before that it does work for them pretty well together. So you don't expect Farid to go nine of ten or sorry ten of eleven moving forward. That's just that's not going to happen. Three blocks is also not going to happen. So this game is is a significant outlier. But that's two solid games in a row for Fred that makes him interesting. Now, Jokic only played the 20 minutes. But this is what I love about this guy. He only played 20 minutes, but he still went 10, 9, and 5. So it wasn't a game where it was an absolute disaster. It wasn't ideal, but it wasn't a disaster. And when he gets these minutes, we know that he's only been limited by fouls. And hopefully he can stay out of foul trouble. But the, the big numbers are going to come. The Rooster, only the 13 minutes for Danilo Gallinari. He had foul issues as well, and that enabled more of those minutes for Fart and Will Barton. Same with Wilson Chandler, who had a lot of foul problems too. 12 points in 27 minutes for Chandler. As for Yusuf Nurkic, I did uh, mention it late, uh, earlier on. 8 minutes, 5 points. Forget about it. 12 team leagues, just get rid of him. Just move on. Get someone else in there. We saw 13 minutes for Jamal Murray and only 15 or 16 minutes for Jameer Nelson. Nelson had four assists. He's just as likely to play 24 minutes in the next game and have 15 and seven. But it is really tough to understand when Malone's going to do that. But if Moutier's got it going, Moutier's going to get the run. So that's the priority that Malone has, making Nelson to me and, and Murray 14 to 16 team league type of players. But 127 points for the Nuggets, man. They are putting up some uh, fairly large scoring performances since changing this lineup. The Blazers and the Warriors, this was a destruction. Mo Harkless was great, though. He uh, he went over the Richie Benno. He had 17 points, three triples, two steals, and two blocks. You know you know my take on him. Own him. Dame Lillard, only the 20 with not much else there. And the rest of the team, pretty poor. Um, CJ McCollum, 10, 4, and 2. And Noah Vonley started and played 24 minutes and had 6 and 8. He, he's just really bad. I just don't ever think he's going to get it. It is his third season, and he was really young when he came into the league. But he just, I just don't have much faith. Evan Turner struggled after I talked him up the other day. Myers Leonard was putrid. Alan Crabb had nine points. It was just ugly. It was the opposite of ugly on the Warriors side, but there's not a lot to grasp from it from a fantasy point of view. You can look at Kevin Durant and say, shit, man, he had 34 points and he took 13 shots. That is ridiculous efficiency. Ridiculous. Now, I've t- spoken about Z scores a couple of times on today's show. His field goal percentage Z score for today was 10.4. That is, that is unheard of. It is ridiculous. His true shooting was 98%. And the fact that he had two other, two other teammates who were pretty close to him is just as ludicrous. Steph Curry had a true shooting of 80% for 19, 3, and 6 with five triples. And Ian Clark, who somehow just, whenever he plays the Blazers, it's just it's the Ian Clark show. 23 points for Clarkie on 9 of 11 shooting, two rebounds, four assists, one steal, and three triples. He had a true shooting of 97%, so just one behind Kevin Durant's 98%. It doesn't get much more efficient than those three guys. Now, as for Clark, you leave him alone unless you're in 18 or 20 team leagues, I would think. This happens occasionally. It's just not reliable enough. Draymond scored three. But he double-doubled with 12 rebounds and 13 assists. Not many of those double-doubles go on. I believe Rubio's had a couple of them recently, and I assume I think Green and Batum have probably had some of them as well. I should check that out as to uh, how many players have had double-doubles without including the points category, but that was what Draymond did here. Zaza Pachulli was back. He played 17 minutes. That restricted JaVale McGee, but he still produced 11-5 and five in 11 minutes for JaVale, a steal and a block, and hit all five of his shots. It's clear that he is the best backup center on this team by a considerable margin. Um, probably just a 20-team 20, 20 leaguer sort of guy. Clay Thompson, yeah, a little bit invisible, 16 points, decent shooting. But when you go 7 of 15, it sort of pales into insignificance when Kevin Durant shoots 85% from the field. Not a lot else really happening on the Warriors' side of things. All right, I'm going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be back to look at Sunday's games. There are seven of them, and start to preview them from a DFS point of view.
All right, everybody, we're back, and let's talk DFS, perfect DFS lineups from Saturday on FanDuel. This is the six-game main slate. Kyrie Irving, 50.2, and Manny Moutier at 38.9. Irving was always in a pretty decent spot. Moutier was uh, somewhat of a punt type of option. I believe I had him in the picks of the day yesterday. I'm not 100% sure, but he's he was not a real solid guy to have a look at there. Uncle P with 40.9 and Ian Clark with 33.4. If you had Ian Clark and Nick Young as your shooting guard combination on FanDuel, I don't know what to tell you. That is ridiculous. Paul George at 43.4, Durant at 54.2, the power forwards, Kevin Love at 53.4, and Ryan Anderson at 41.2, and the center was Carl Anthony Towns with 62.5, and, and that lineup would have given you 418.1 for DraftKings. Ian Clark, he had 35 points. Uncle P, he had 45 points. Devin Booker, 42.75, Carl Anthony Towns, 68.25, Billy Hernan Gomez, 37.5. Russ Westbrook, 81.25. Love had 58.25. And Ryan Anderson had 46 for a total of 414 points. So some uh, some pretty huge nights in the DFS realm today, which um, we've been a little bit down on some performances, I guess, recently, but a, a huge night of performances there. Now, we've got seven games on Sunday. Some of them are early. We've got a game that's taking place at, what time is it, 3.30 p.m. We've got a game at 4 p.m., and then we've got games that start at 6 p.m., and the last game of the night starts at 7. So we've got no late games whatsoever. So that's, you know, that's interesting now you've got to check your your site check your slate as to what games are included but with the games starting from 3 30 and, and last one starting at 7 it's sort of like all of the slates pushed forward four hours and that's uh, that's where we are now no uh no nba players to t- test our birthday theory on uh, on sunday either the first game that we're going to take a look at is one of those early games of course the los angeles clippers and the washington wizards my uh Looks like my uh, thingos are all over the place. What, what do you call them? My uh, my graphics on the YouTube video. That's always disappointing when that happens. Anyway, the Clippers are favoured by five, and the total is 216 points. Jason Smith is questionable with a hamstring issue, and Kelly Oubre for Washington has already been ruled out. Let's talk point guards. Look, Mute is out as well for the Clippers, so I should have mentioned that. Austin Rivers at 3,900. One big game. One stinker in the two games that he started at 3900 It's not an expensive price for a bloke who's probably going to play 30-plus minutes. I think you can look at Rivers, and I think you can take a punt on him in a tournament, but I definitely wouldn't want to be doing it in any sort of um, in any sort of uh, cash game scenario. Chrissy Paul and John Wall, the two big names here. Paul is at 9200 He's been a little bit under where he needs to be, averaging 41 over the last five games, but I don't mind him. It's just there is a little bit of risk associated with it. I'm not. I wouldn't feel all that confident in cash. And John Wall, despite the fact that he's been killing it, the matchup against Chris Paul is not a positive one, and he's now up to nine thousand nine hundred. So that is obviously a uh, a pretty decent chunk of um of cash to spend on someone like John Wall. Would would I do it, or would I take seven hundred less on Chris Paul? I would definitely take seven hundred less. On Chris Paul in this scenario, Ray Felton and Trey Burke aren't worth t- talking about. JJ Redick is at 4100. Not for me. Not in a matchup against the Wizards, who do uh, who do, do limit shooting guards to a uh, a relatively substantial degree. So I think he is a, a fade. As for Brad Beal at seven thousand dollars, the Clippers limit shooting guards to a pretty significant amount as well. So I'm not all that interested in Beal over there at. Uh, at 7,000. just feels too hot. You look, Beal is averaging just a shade under 34 in the last five games. But against the Clippers, it's not a situation that I want to be interested in. Marcus Thornton, Thomas Sataransky, these guys are going to get a little bit of a bump with Ubre out. Not enough to consider using them, though. At small forward, Otto Porter's at 5,500. Oh, I think it's time for me to get back onto Porter. I don't know what it is. Look, he, he took a few more shots in the last game, had 10 of them, put up 28 points. He's at 5,500. There's no Luke Marmute on the wing that's potentially guarding him. I think at 5,500, you can look at Porter with no Ubre around as well. Maybe he gets in you know, 38, 39 minutes. He could go right up in the minutes, and I think this is a good bet to take a look at him. Other small forwards... We're talking Wes Johnson, so in other words, we're not talking other small forwards at all. Markeith Morris is at $5,000. I think that his upside is not necessarily massive. Um, 
I think he's got use at that at that price point. He's averaging 26.5 over the last three, 25 over the last five. Yeah, he's had a decent 37-point game in the last five, and he always looks like he, he might just shit the bed and, and struggle, but he just seems to always get back to that 5,000 number. So I think he's good. And Blake Griffin at 8,700 is one of the better uh, high-priced power forwards that is on the board. So I would, uh, I would be okay taking a look at him. I'm going to talk about the centers in this one. DeAndre Jordan, he's at 7,400. Um, I'm, I'm all okay with that. He's been he's been playing really well recently. He's averaging over 41 over the last three games, so I think that he is definitely worth worth a look. While Martin Gortat at 63, mm, not in this matchup, and he's he's really been struggling to get back to that value in majority of his recent games. So I don't think that Gortat is a is a really good uh, really good guy to take a look at. The next game we take a look at. Fingers crossed that my uh, my graphics work when I put this one up. The Sacramento Kings and the Dallas Mavericks. There we go. No spread released for this one yet. Omri Caspi is questionable with his illness, and Rudy Gay is doubtful with his hip flexor strain. So we're going to get a situation where we could have a good Caspi game. We could have an increased chance of a Matt Barnes game. We could have an increased chance of a Costa Kufos game. A few variables here for Sacramento. So you'd want to hear what's going on. We'll assume Gay is out, but we want to hear what's going on with Caspi before, you know, where all the value necessarily lies. At point guard, I don't mind Darren Williams. Now, he's highly priced on Fangio. He's much lower priced than some of the other sites. At 6,300, Williams is getting you 31 points over the last three. I think he's not bad at that price. On a day where, to be honest, there's not great value all around the DFS land on Sunday. So there's going to be some shit plays out there. And Williams is not... I think he's got a fairly solid floor, especially going up against the Kings. But I wouldn't like his price just to be a little bit cheaper. The Kings point guards, Darren Collison's at 58. Well, he's just really struggling to get anywhere near that value. And against Dallas, that makes me not interested at all. Same with Ty Lawson and Devin Harris. At shooting guard, I'm not a Garrett Temple fan, but the extra minutes are going to be there. He's at 4,200. He dropped 32 in the last game. He's averaging 26 over the last three. If he's going to get 34, 35 minutes, which might even get higher if Caspi happens to be out, it's really hard to go away from Garrett Temple. So I do like him as a cheap shooting guard option. Wes Matthews at 5,600 is is definitely variable in what he can do. But despite, even when he has a, a stinker, which he did the other day, it was still 19 points, which is not terrible at 5,600. And then he's got the 35 plus upside to go with. So I think he's a solid shooting guard. Seth Curry had 25 in the last game. This is, um, you talk revenge game, sometimes it means nothing. I feel there's a little bit in this for Seth Curry against a team that, that limited him significantly last season. Then he played well, and they showed no effort to really match or, or re-sign him. A really weird situation with his uh, restricted free agency tender. I think at 4,200, Seth Curry is a, is a, is a pretty high-interest tournament sort of guard to me. Benny McLemore, he's just doing nothing, so I think we'll pass on him. At small forward, the pencil is at 6,300. Not sure his tournament upside's high, but his cash value is fairly solid. It's a really good matchup for him as well, especially if Rudy Gay is out. He could, uh, he should just get 32, 33, and at 6,300, that's really all you need. Dorian Finney-Smith at 4,000. No thanks. Uh, yeah, look, he's got the upside. He did hit, well, actually, he had one game where he had a huge night, but otherwise... You know, how how do we trust it? It's a, it is a good matchup for him, um, but I I don't have a huge amount of faith in that. Matty Barnes at forty two. Ignore if Caspi is in. If Caspi is out, we'd have to look at him. He played twenty nine the last game and put up twenty four points, which at forty two hundred is absolutely fine. Now the Mavericks defense at his position at the three and the four is not ideal. That's something of a concern, but I think the opportunity for him there and the ability for him to get 30 points is not is not tough. Uh, you'd have to consider Barnsley if Caspi happens to be out. Power forwards, Dwighty Powell, he's at 4,100. He just, I don't know, he's mm, he's definitely not a cash game player, not a chance, especially in a matchup where at times he might have to be on boogie. That could work out fairly negatively for Dwight Powell. Omri Caspi at 4,300. I like Caspi. It is, he hasn't really performed that well in Gay's absence. I think that there is an opportunity for him, but this is not a beautiful matchup. I would look at him more as a tournament guy rather than a cash sort of player. Anthony Tolliver has put up really good numbers recently. Uh, even in the last game, put up 15 points in 30 minutes. 
if Caspi is out, he gets extra run. Could he re- replicate that 31-point game he had a couple of nights ago against Houston? I would say that's a doubt. But at 3,800, if the minutes are there and Caspi's out, he is definitely someone that you can take a look at. At center, Salah Mejri at 3,900. It could be great for him, but the boogie risk is just ridiculously high. So I don't want to use Mejri in any cash. In tournaments, he can easily have 25 points. Not, not a problem. He's done it already. Against Boogie, in the last time, he had nine points. And that's probably where we uh, where I you know, lean more towards. So he is not a strong option. Costa Kufos with Caspi out has been great. Had 40 in the last game. He's averaging 30 in the last three. At 4,200, I really like using Kufos. Again, assuming Gay and Caspi are both out. As for Boogie, he's at 11,200. His last three games only yielded 43 points, which is really subpar for DeMarcus Cousins. Can he repay 11,200? Without many um, high-priced value guys on the board, I think you can find a way to put Cousins in and surround him with some other cheaper options. He could be a, a, a pretty good um, a pretty good play. I do like some other centers. You know, maybe like Hassan Whiteside and save me that $3,000. But if I've got $3,000 left over, then, of course, Cousins is going to be the way that I'm going to be leaning. Let's move on to the next game. And it is the Toronto Raptors and the Orlando Magic. The Raptors are favored by five and a half, and the total is 218 points. No uh, injury worries to really talk about here. Nick Vucevic returned last game for Orlando at point guard. It's a little bit Russian roulette for the Orlando Magic. Last two games, DJ Augustine has played more minutes than Lord Alfred Payton, but only one of those was a good one. He had 29 in the last game in 27 minutes, and at 3,800, his ability to get 30 points makes him very appealing in tournaments. It makes him shocking for cash because we just don't know. Is he going to play 20? Is he going to play 25? Is he going to play 30? Is he going to have 10 points or is he going to have 30 points? He is so up and down with what he does that he is a tough one to have a look at, but with the, the trend of the minutes going towards him, I like him in a tournament. As for Lord Alfred, um, tough to know. Again, he's had some monsters. He's at 5,700. He is averaging 35 over the last three games, amazingly. 28 over the last five. But the range of performances in there is so large that in cash, you've got no chance of being able to rely upon that. Corey Joseph has been really good for Toronto. I don't like the fact that he's at 4,300, but he is averaging 27 points over the last three. If the Raptors throttle the Magic, which is a huge chance... Does Joseph get some extra run? And does he get a chance to go for 25 points plus? Yeah. The thing I'll say is that he's got too much variability with not enough upside for me to really even consider him in tournaments. And Cash, I'll say, forget about it. Shooting guard, love DeMar DeRozan here at 8,600. This should be a 40.1, just not, not, not really too much of a concern for DeMar. Love that there. And Evan Fournier at 5,900. The ease ranking for shooting guards against the Raptors is not ideal. But he is not a complete uh, not a complete write-off. I just don't love it at 59. I'd prefer it a little bit lower, but I don't have control over the salary. So I do have to consider him as an option. Small forwards, Aaron Gordon at 44. Definitely playing a lot better. Is the matchup good for him? No. Is the reliability good for him? No. Is he a tournament option? Sure. That's sort of where he fits. And he's actually dropped 300 bucks in salary. So that makes him more appealing there. Damari Carroll is at 4,000. I highlighted him yesterday I believe on the show and all this talk of him looking better recently has been complete bullshit because he's been poor and look at his DFS numbers and it sort of reflects that averaging 17 over the last five it is a really good matchup for Damari and he could easily have 28 not not a problem with that and that makes him a tournament guy only Jeffy Green at 37 Mm. so tough to you get a real handle on what Green is going to do. He's a tournament guy, but with less less tournament appeal ability. I don't think that's a real word. T- tournament appeal than what Carroll and Gordon do both in the same game. At power forward, we're looking at Patrick Patterson from the Raptors at 4,300. Yeah, look, he can do some stuff, but I really think his upside is so limited and his downside is not great. So he's a pass for me. Well, Serge Barker at 6,400. Yeah, I don't love it at 6,400. His upside's probably 40, which is not really high enough when his downside is like 20. And that's that's just not, not an ideal scenario. Plus, it's a terrible matchup at center. Bismack Biombo against his former team at 4,600. He's been solid numbers. He's definitely not a tournament option. In cash, he is okay. But even then, I'm not 
fantastically in favor of it. 5,400 for Jonas Valanciunas. Good matchup. Centers are putting up some decent numbers against Orlando. I'm not sure I rely upon him just yet either. Vucevic had 48 in the last game, which is fantastic, no doubt. But I can't rely that he's going to get 33 minutes. He might play 27. He might play 28. It's just too unreliable at 7,000 for me to have any sort of faith in that as well. Nor will be we be using Bebe Noguera. The next game we take a look at, we've got the uh, the Memphis Grizzlies and the Utah Jazz. This is not uh, an appealing fantasy matchup. The Jazz are favored by one and a half, and the total is 185 and a half. Chandler Parsons was officially listed as questionable by Memphis, but Tim McMahon came out with a report later on saying he had, it is very unlikely that Parsons plays in this game, so don't expect him in. James Ennis has been upgraded to probable, so he will likely play. Jarrell Martin is probable with a foot issue, whether he makes the rotation or not. With, uh, with Ennis back remains to be seen. And on the Utah side of things, I'm sure you'll all be so surprised to know that George Hill is listed as questionable. Let's talk point guards. Now, if Hill is out as expected, uh, Shelvin Mack is going to be the guy to look at. He's at 4,100. He's averaging 21 over the last three. He is decent to use, and I'm not sure how high his actual upside is, especially in what looks to be a low-tempo game. But he is not bad to look at. Exum is, is not good to look at. As for Conley at 7,100, I'd like to see him off his minutes limit before I spend $7,000 on him. So you can uh, leave him to some other blokes on your in your league. Rod Hood at 54 for the shooting guards. Like what Rod's doing. Um, he's done very well against Memphis previously. This is okay, but it's really look, there's actually there's nothing spectacular in this matchup whatsoever. Yeah, you know, Tone Allen at 53 is is all right, but if Ennis returns, I worry that that. Tone Allen plays 34 minutes. He played 34 in the last one. He had 32 points. But I just really worried that he's going to get enough minutes if Ennis returns. So he is a tough guy to have a look at. Troy Daniels, maybe not won't even play at all if Ennis returns. So you're not going to use him. Small forwards, Gordy Haywood at 7,700. Um, low tempo, bad matchup. He is only averaging 28 over the last three. I'm not spending up on Gordy Haywood. Joe Johnson, Vince Carter, Ennis, Ingles, Williams. None of these guys should be making lineups. At power forward, Jermichael Green is really struggling. He's at 5,000. You could punt on him, but man, big man going up against Utah, not not a fan. 5,700 for Zach Randolph, again, not a fan. Not against Utah. Trey Lyles, Derek Favors, Boris Dia, a three-man power forward rotation is not working in anyone's favor. And the centers, this is where the, the big things come in because the, the one of the standard... DFS tenants this season has been, man, you play against Marcus Sol and the Grizzlies, you go down as a center. You play against Rudy Gobert, you get annihilated. Well, now they're going against each other. So what does that mean? It means I probably don't want either of them. 8,400 for Marcus Sol, way too expensive, considering he's not even averaging 40 over the last three games, and now he's got to get Gobert. No thanks. Gobert has, is averaging 37 points, which is great, but he's at 7,500. So that means he needs to get that. He needs to get 38 points for me to really care and then he gets gasoled. I, I would be leaving these guys to other people. I just don't see the upside for them to go off for really huge games in this type of a scenario, unfortunately, because uh, obviously we like both guys. Brooklyn and Philadelphia is the next game we're going to take a look at. The Sixers are favored by two and a half points, and the total is 216. So the difference between this one and that Memphis-Utah game is a 30-point difference. And that is huge. That is such a big difference for, for a fantasy point of view. Hollis Thompson is probable with knee soreness. It's not going to make too much of an impact anyway. Uh, Nerlens Noel is probable with shit attitude. Let's see what... Oh, and I'm joking. He's not actually probable. I'm not joking about his shit attitude, but he will play. Point guards. I like Spanish chocolate here. He was limited in the last game, but what Brett Brown has done is he'll, he'll limit... He would split the minutes between him and TJ McConnell, and then the next game go back to Rodriguez. That's been his pattern for most of the season. So I imagine it happening here at 4,800. It is a little bit risky, but the matchup is so incredibly tasty for Spanish chocolate that you have to look, and he could easily have 30 here. So I do like it as a as a cheap option. Jeremy Lin at 6,600. Look, he's been great, but when you're only getting 20 minutes, I don't want to spend 6,600 on a guy only getting 20 minutes. So I will uh, I will leave that. Unless they say there's no restriction, Lin is starting. Let's let's go. Isaiah Whitehead at 3,700. The minutes for him will come down as Lin's, minutes for Lin go up so we can forget about him 
as well. And TJ McConnell, yeah, TJ McConnell's worth a punt. You know what? At $4,000, if they split the minutes again, which I don't believe they will, but if they do, then McConnell's going to get 20 to 24 points, and that's going to work out in your favor. At shooting guard, Gerald Henderson, nah. Shawnee Kilpatrick, 5,400. His usage suffers a significant drop when Jeremy Lin is around. So at 5,400, that is too highly priced for me. I will not be investing. Source Castillo is at 36. No. Joe Harris, also no. Small forwards, Bob Cup. Yeah, I love Bob Cup here. $5,000. A as beautiful a matchup as you can get as a wing player. He played 36 in the last game. His shot didn't fall. He still had 23 points, so he almost made value without even having a shot fall. He can go. He can have 40. This is a really good spot for for uh, Robert Covington. Boyan Bogdanovich is at 46. Uh, no, I, I don't love it. You would consider it in a tournament. But if there's one thing that the Sixers do, and that's have a really awesome wing defender in Bob Cup. So Boyan could get uh, restricted there. Don't Don't love it. Rondé Hollis-Jefferson producing, just not getting enough minutes. He's averaging 18 points in the last three games in 18 minutes. And at 3,800, that's almost right on where he needs to be for value. But I just don't trust that he's going to be a point-per-minute guy. Give him 27 minutes, and I'd be all over it. I just don't think that's going to be happening, unfortunately. At uh, power forward, Trevor Booker is at 5,800. A bit of a down game for Booker, but I think that he can bounce back and get close to returning 5,800 in value. I think he's solid without being spectacular, whereas Ursan Ilyasova, he showed that he can actually you know, produce when Noel Okafor and Embiid are around, and he is coming off the bench behind Okafor. Had 27 in the last game in 27 minutes. He's going at over a point per minute over the last 36. At 5,500, if we expect Ilyasova to get 27 minutes, then he's good to go. If you think he's going to get 24, then he's risky. So in, in essence, he's a risky tournament type type of player. Anthony Bennett, Dario Saric, Nerlens Noel, Luis Scholar, a couple of really recognizable names in there that aren't really going to be of much use in D DFS. For the centers, this is where it's happening, though. Joel Embiid is down to 6,800, much more appealing. Centers against Brooklyn, man, it, it generally happens in a pretty big way. So love him. Jilly Loka for 51. Can't really complain about that either, averaging 28.5 over the last five, some with Embiid, some without. His lowest score in his last five would actually bring him back value, 25.6. I can't see why you wouldn't be looking at Oka for. Brook Lopez. 7,500. He had 39 in the last game. I don't like that his salaries jumped 500 bucks. That is somewhat of a turnoff, but I think that he can get 35 in this matchup as well. So he is he is worth a look, but I would take Embiid and Okafor both over Brook Lopez. Let's talk about the, uh, the next game that's up, and that is the Boston Celtics and the Miami Heat. We have got the uh, Celtics favored by four, and the total is 201.5 points. A couple of interesting situations for Miami. Tyler Johnson is ill. He is questionable, while Wayne Allington is questionable with a mild right hamstring strain. I would doubt that Allington plays, and I would think that Johnson does. Let's talk point guards. If, Well, regardless of if Johnson plays or not, I like Goran Dragic here at 7,400. He had a monster 48-pointer in the last game, and I think he should be around 35 regardless of Johnson's status. If Johnson is out, it bumps Dragic up a significant amount. As for Johnson at 5,500, that's a little bit risky to use him in uh, in somewhat of a backup role, but if Ellington's out, then that makes Johnson more appealing. So I would, I would definitely consider him. Isaiah Thomas at 8,100. I would not take Isaiah Thomas over Goran Dragic. 700 bucks more expensive, yeah, lower output, worse matchup. I, I wouldn't want... Look, you could punt and pivot to him in a tournament. I'm just not that interested. Marcus Smart at 5,000 is too expensive. Shooting guards, Joshy Richardson at 4,300. Good matchup. Um, maybe an opportunity with Wayne Ellington now for him to go back into the starting lineup if Ellington happens to be out. It's just a tournament punt, though, really, with Richardson at this point. Well, Avery Bradley at 7,000. I don't want to spend 7,000 on Avery Bradley. I I know that he occasionally can have that game, but not against Miami. Justice Winslow at 4,700. Played 30 minutes in the last game, or 29. Had 21 points, which is okay, but at 4,700, it's not awesome. In a tournament, sure. He's just not a real huge stat stuffer, though. Jay Crowder at 55. Yeah, it just feels like it's almost the right price, which is not ideal for tournaments. And there's some decent cash value in there with a fairly high floor for Crowder. Whereas James Johnson at 4,900, he has been 
yeah, pretty solid recently, averaging 25 over the last three and 4,900. That's okay. I think we see him playing in the front court some, which is really good given his matchup against the Celtics there. So I think that Johnson at 4,900 is a decent low upside cash play. Power forwards. Uh, yuck. Josh McRoberts, Amir Johnson, Jonas Yerepko, Luke Babbitt. Let's move on to the centers. 8,900 for Hassan Whiteside. Love this. Love the matchup for Whiteside. He should be looking at 40-plus, almost without a doubt here, and really should be looking at 45. This is a good spot for him, and that's the direction I'd be heading if I'm not spending up on Boogie Cousins. Kelly Olynyk is good. He just doesn't play enough. He is averaging almost 20 over the last three, and at 3,700, that's fine. I just You can't rely upon it. Whereas Al Horford at 7,900, look, he broke value in the last game with 48 points, but I just don't think that spending almost 8,000 on Al Horford is is probably the most, it's probably the smartest idea. I, I, don't, I don't believe it is anyway. Let's take a look at the last game of the night. It is the San Antonio Spurs and the New Orleans Pelicans. No spread has been released for this one yet because we don't know if Anthony Davis is playing the pussy. He is questionable with that left leg bruise. Dante Cunningham is questionable after his fibula fracture. Solomon Hill, we assume Hill is back, but he missed the last game for the birth of his child. And Timmy Frazier is probable. After returning from a 10-day absence in two days, he played, and now he's listed as probable. So we assume Frazier plays, and then there's obviously some concerns. If Davis happens to be out, then it's obvious we're going Terrence Jones and Alexi Jinsa. They're going to be the two options there. If Dante Cunningham, Solomon Hill happen to be out, there's more minutes for wings like Frazier, like uh, like Jones to a degree as well. It's one more buddy healed. You can use all of our scenarios on Basketball Monster to have a look at all those situations. I'll talk about what's going to happen or what I think is going to happen if all these players actually play. And to be honest, there's not a ton of fantasy value in this one. Point guards, Tone Parker at 4,200. He just doesn't do enough to get me excited. It's a good matchup for him. So as a low percentage owned tournament guy, you could look at him. I wouldn't look at him too hard though. 7,000 for Drew Holiday. Yeah, I like it. I don't like it against the Spurs, though. That's my that's my concern with Drew there. Timmy Frazier, if we have one of those wings out, Frazier is interesting. He played 25 in the last game, but at 5,500, he is a significant risk. If he plays 35 minutes, which is always possible because Gentry is changing things every five minutes, it would be interesting. I'm not going to look at him, though, given the matchup, given the uncertainty of, of playing him. Um, Paddy Mills at 4,200. Hasn't really been cracking that value recently, so I'll, uh, I'll pass on him. Shooting guards, Manu, no thanks. Danny Green, yuck. He's at minimum Sally, Danny Green, but even now I don't even feel like taking a punt on him. Eats one more at 37, no. Langston Galloway at 38, no. They both dropped down a lot in salary, and if we have Hill and or Cunningham out, or both of them out, you would consider them in a tournament, but it's really hard to look at Etoine Moore and Langston Galloway and be confident in their value. Bud Heald is playing more, but it doesn't translate into big DFS points. He's averaging 19 over the last three. He did have a 27-pointer in there, which is impressive at 3,800. I think you're going to need a couple of outs there for, for Heald to really be considered, um, whether that's Davis for some usage, Davis and Hill, Davis and Cunningham, or Cunningham and and, uh, and Hill. That will give Heald, uh, Heald a little bit more extra run, but if everyone plays, it's going to be tough to rely on Buddy. Tyreek should be back as well for New Orleans. At 6,500, you won't be using Tyreek. Tyreek Evans. Small forwards, Kawhi at 8,300. No one on the Pelicans can stop him. Um, the only thing that's going to stop him is a blowout and minutes, but I think he's a really solid option. Solly Hill, John Simmons, Dante Cunningham, Kyle Anderson, Davis Bertans. No thanks for any of them. Now, LaMarcus Aldridge has been horrible this season. That's not. There's no debating that. At 6,200, in a matchup that might not include Anthony Davis... I think that he is a very interesting, hopefully low-owned punt option in a tournament. I would have no issue using him there. I'd have lots of issue with using him in a cash game because he's been dreadful. But at some point, he is going to have a game, and this yeah, appears to be a really good option for him to do it in or a good opportunity for him to do it in. Dave Lee, no. Anthony Davis, um, 11,800. Spurs, I think I'll fade Anthony. We don't even know if he's playing. I would fade him at that almost $12,000 price tag. Anyway, Terrence Jones, obviously, we look at it 4800 If Dave, We don't look at him. We play him if Davis is out at 4800 
at center, 6,300 for Pau Gasol. He's been playing very well, averaging over 31 over the last five. A positive matchup for him. The price is a little bit off-putting, but it's not completely. He is in play. Dwayne Dedman at 36 is just a tournament punt option. That price is low, but he had 24 in the last game and only took 23 minutes to do it. So we know he can do it. He's, a, he's over a point per minute over his last five games. Does he get 13 minutes? Does he get 18 minutes? Does he get 22 minutes? And that's the uh, that's the thing there is that maybe they give him some extra run in this game. So he is he is a consideration for a tournament. Ejinsa, we're not looking at him unless Davis is out. He had 22 points in 22 minutes in the last game with Davis missing half of that. And he can be that point per minute type of guy who takes a significant bump whenever he whenever he plays without Anthony Davis. All right, that is it for the DFS action for Sunday. Let's talk picks of the day now on Fangio. Spanish Chocolate at 48, Goran Dragic, 74, and Chrissy Paul, 92. Shooting Guards, Garrett Temple, 42, Wes Matthews, 56, and DeMar DeRozan, 86. For the Small Fords, Bob Cubs is at 5,000. Otto Porter is at 55, and Kawhi is at 83. Power Fords, Mark Keefe is 5,000. LaMarcus Aldridge, 62, and Blakey Griffin, 87. And the centers, Costa Kufos, 42, Joel Embiid, 68, and Hassan Whiteside, 89. On DraftKings, DJ Augustine, 38, Darren Williams, 57, Chris Paul, 89. Seth Curry, 35, Rod Hood, 51, and DeMar DeRozan, 82. Small Fords, Boyan Bogdanovich, 47, Otto Porter, 56, and Kawhi at 85. For the Power Fords, Dwight Powell as a punt, obviously, at 38, Marquee, 52, and Boogie at 10,900. And the centers, Dwayne Dedman at 34, Pau Gasol, 56, and Hassan Whiteside, 8,300. The Aussies, let's look at Moneyball. DJ Augustine, minimum 3,500. Darren Williams, 55. And Kyle Lowry, 84. The shooting guards, Garrett Temple, 36. Brad Beal, 62. And DeRozan, 82. Bob Cobb for the small forwards at 48. The pencil at 59. And Kawhi at 83. Power forwards, Costa Kufos, 35. A minimum. Aldridge is at 55. That is really appealing at that salary. And Blake Griffin, 83. And the centers, Jolly Local 449, Joel Embiid 62, and Hassan Whiteside 85. On draft stars, DJ Augustine 6550, Drew Holiday 125, and Kyle Lowry 15650. Shooting guards, Tone Allen 73, Goran Dragic 124, and DeMar DeRozan 15350. Small forwards, James Johnson 7400, Boyan Bogdanovich 84, and Kawhi Leonard 156. Power forwards, Patrick Patterson, 75, Bismack Biombo 81, and Dwayne Dedman, 6850, Jolly Locafor, 9650, Joel Embiid, 15650. We're done. If you've got a spare second, do me a favor and leave a review on iTunes. It's always greatly appreciated if you can do that. Follow me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Good luck to your lineups. Good luck to your teams. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Stan Van Gundy.